Okay, so we'll go back to another video. So here we have a double integral with a balance from 0, 1, 0, 1 of our integrand x multiplied with the fractional part of 1 divided by 1 minus x times y followed with dy dx. So it actually may look difficult from a first glance considering that we have a double integral when we're evaluating but also with the fractional part function involved as part of our integrand but it's actually not as bad as it seems. So to outline how I want to um, do this video, so there is a result that we're going to be using that's part of the process for this workload. And if I didn't show that, the video would be short on itself without any sort of verification or validity added to it. That it's very important that I think we um, take a look at it in closer inspection before we actually start evaluating this integral. So this integral that we will evaluate first as part of the proof that's, uh, that's a tool that we'll be using later is that this is valid for all positive real numbers for some m. So I'll write the integral in just a sec for what that m is for, and then proof that from there. And then eventually, as we start evaluating this integral, get into that result we need to help use that validity that we can actually help support that indeed that this will be that they'll give us the nice result that we want to achieve for. So with that, let's actually start off with this proof. Okay, so here's the definite integral we would like to prove our result so that the integral from 0 to 1 of t to the power m, where m is some positive real number, uh, multiplied with the fractional part of 1 divided by t dt is equal to 1 divided by m subtract the Riemann zeta at m plus 1 divided by m plus 1. So how to start this proof off, let's actually call this, I'll call this integral uh, capital I sub m as a function. So capital I of m, then what I'll do is let's actually perform a little u substitution. So I'll let u equals 1 divided by t then we have to change this up so that we have t by itself. So that in other words, t is equal to one divided by u. And if I differentiate both sides for here, so I have that dt is equal to negative one divided by u squared and then du. So plugging all this back in, so now we have the new integral. So if I plug in the new bounds for u, so if I plug one, so that means there's gonna be one here. If I plug zero, so that's actually going to approach positive infinity. So we can really see that we have uh, something we need to change in terms of the differential because with the negative. And so now putting this back together, I have one divided by u to the power m. Then we multiply this by the fractional of u and then we'll substitute with our du for our dt differential. So negative one divided by u squared, then du. And so we can actually fix this up a bit for one, change the bounds and that'll get rid of that negative itself since after changing that, that'll become a negative itself. So this will become one to infinity of the fractional of u and then divided by u to the power m plus two du. Here's something to consider because again, there's the fractional part that we need to um, get that out of the way in terms of the definition. So by definition, let me put that first. By definition, the fractional of u is equal to u subtract the floor of u. And so to add furthermore into the definition that u is equal to k, such that k is less than or equal to u, strictly less than k plus one for some positive, or not some positive, for some integer k. So using that definition, so we can actually substitute some things over here. And so we can get a new integral using that substitution of the fractional part. So we can substitute this to say we have from one to infinity, and then substitute with the, the fractional part definition over here. So that means this will become u subtract the floor of u and divided by u to the power m plus two. Then with this, we can actually do a little bit of substitution in terms of the floor function definition that we just put in. But because we're doing this from one to infinity, we have to break this step by step. So in other words, I can write this in terms of an infinite sum. So put this perspectively, the infinite sum from k, at k is equal to one of the integral from k all the way up to k plus one of u subtract k and then divided by u to the power m plus two and then du. Finding the antiderivative, this is simple. Let's actually take things a little bit um, carefully and split this in terms of using linear area with two, the difference of two integrals. So now the infinite sum k is equal to one so now I'll have the integral from k to k plus one. So let's first focus on the u. So u divided by u m plus two. So I can actually write this in a way. So it's u to the power negative m subtract one du. Then I subtract with the integral same bounds k to k plus one. So I have a k and then divided by 
uh, u to the power m plus 2, so k, then u, negative m minus 2, and then du. And so now that can be further evaluated to say this is the infinite sum, k is equal to 1. Of now this is u to the power negative m divided by negative m then add this with k to the power u to the power or k multiplied by u to the power negative m minus 1 then divided by m plus 1 and then we evaluate this from k plus 1 to k now all we have to do is just plug in our bounds for k plus 1 and k here so simple as that that We'll have this following over here, infinite sum, k is equal to 1. So if I plug into k plus 1 first, then we'll have the following. I'll have, um, so the denominator is m plus 1, then times k plus 1 to the power m plus 1. Then our numerator on the top, that's going to be k. Then we subtract with 1, then divided by m to the power k plus, or m times k plus 1 to the power m. So that's, that's everything to um, evaluate for the k plus 1 term. Subtract this, so now we have to evaluate this for k. So this is k divided by m plus 1, then multiply with k to the power m plus 1, then subtract 1 divided by m to the power, or m times k to the power m. So we can, this looks like a lot to deal with, so that's fine. Let's actually separate some things out. So because we have ones with the numerators k and then ones with and just ones, so to put, this, to put this a little easier, so I can actually do this with subtractions of sums. So to separate everything out and put this back together is 1. So now I'll have 1 divided by m to the times k to the power m. Subtract 1 divided by m. Multiply with k plus 1 to the power m. Then now add this. So this C, so this new sum over here, infinity k is equal to 1. So, sub, so now I have k then divided by m plus 1 multiply with k plus 1 to the power m plus 1 then subtract with k then divided by m plus 1 multiply with k to the power m plus 1. Okay so with this now notice that I can factor out a 1 over m from here the sum does not depend on the index m so that's good. Same thing over here I'll factor out m plus 1 so now 1 divided by m, then multiply with the infinite sum, k is equal to 1, then now I have 1 divided by k to the power m, then subtract, so you get the gist, I just factor out the um, k, the 1 over m and then the 1 over m plus 1, so let me actually just um, finish writing this out. And so, what you'll notice is that, now if I were to take this, if we're, we're focusing on this sum over here, we'll worry about the 1 over m and we'll worry about this later. So if you pay attention closely, if I evaluate things each index one at a time, and rather we can actually write this, I'm skipping one step, so we can actually write this in a limit such that um, the limit as capital N approaches infinity up the upper index is N, you'll notice that this entire thing is actually a telescoping series. And so that actually, if you take a look closely and evaluate this carefully, this is actually going to equal just one. And so that means I have a one over M times one, so that's out of the way, and then we just have to evaluate this sum over here which this actually may look a little bit um, deceiving, but actually with a little bit of simplification rewriting, it's actually not that bad to solve. Now here, I'm just continuing forward. This is gonna be one divided by M, then add this with one divided by M plus one. And then now we're just left with this infinite sum over here, K is equal to one of this. So how do we actually proceed with something for a sum like this? Well, specifically focusing on this term over here, I can actually rewrite this by putting an add, by adding and subtracting a one. So what's nice is that because they shared a k plus one over here, so that actually can cancel out one of the exponents. And then on the other side, we have a minus one divided by this denominator over here. And so we actually rearrange some things a little bit. So now, so far, after that, performing that rearrangement, I'll have one divided by k plus, k plus one to the power m then subtract 1 divided by k to the power m, then subtract 1 divided by k plus 1 to the power m plus 1. And so what you'll notice is that 
This is just ex this is just exactly the same thing we just calculated over here, except the terms reverse. So instead of a positive one, this term actually evaluates to negative one. So negative one. And then if you look closely over here, this is actually in terms of the definition by Riemann zeta function. But keep in mind that if you start the index for k is equal to one that starts with one over two, then this, then so on. We have to evaluate for the the part for one divided by one. So in other words, one. So all you have to do really is just subtract the one from whatever from that definition of that Riemann zeta function. And so lastly, putting all this back together, I have now this is one divided by m, then plus one divided by well, rather, this is going to be, well, actually, hold on. So putting this all together, so I have 1 divided by m plus 1 divided by m plus 1. So this is a negative 1 over here. And then now over here, the, uh, we said that this is minus the Riemann zeta at m plus 1, and then subtract that 1 from that term we just have to, you know, calculate from there. Then simplify everything together. So let's see, negative 1, then minus, and then that become a positive, so the 1 will cancel. And so lastly, this actually does indeed conclude the calculation for that this integral is indeed equal to 1 divided by m subtract, so I have the minus, that's why, subtract with the Riemann zeta at m plus 1, and then divided by m plus 1 which indeed that concludes the calculation that we need to evaluate for this little result that eventually we're actually going to be using as we now get into evaluating this integral over here. Okay, so now with that result proven, so let's actually now uh, calculate this double integral. So we'll start off by doing a little u substitution. We'll call this t. I'll let t equals x times y. Keep in mind that we're in the differential for dy, so if the differentiate in respect to y, so this leaves us with dt is equal to x times dy. And to put this simply, to get the dy on itself, I'll divide x. And so now we have that dy is equal to dt divided by x. Okay, so from here now, let's actually put that back in. So the integral from 0 to 1. And then now with our new bounds, so plugging this in, so I'll have from 1, this is going to be 0. And then over here, this is going to be x. So this means I have x, then multiply with the differential, well, I mean the fractional, 1 divided by 1 minus t. Then now put in our new dy differential, so dt divided by x, then multiply with dx. So of course that's going to cancel the x's here, so this is the integral from 0 to 1, integral from 0 to x, of the fractional of 1 divided by 1 minus t, and then now just left with is dt then dx. All right, so now we're actually gonna do something a little bit clever here. So we're actually gonna do a little bit of some integration by parts, but this actually looks a little bit weird that we're actually, there's an integral inside of an integral. So you wouldn't think that this might not be possible. So we don't actually have to use our clever notation on how we were taught by using u, du, dv, v, finding those you know variables. We can actually just call it functions. So using this clever trick that we can do here, so suppose that I'll let f of x We'll let f of x equals the integral from 0 to x of the fractional of 1 divided by 1 minus t, and then dt. Okay, so seems so straightforward from here. So differentiate both sides, so f prime of x. So you'll see where I'm coming from is that we can actually apply a little bit of fundamental, of fundamental theorem of calculus. And so now that actually comes down to just the fractional of one divided by one minus x. Okay, so now we can actually use now in this case, g prime of x and substitute of a dv. So g prime of x, we'll just let that equal one. So antiderivative of that of course is that g of x is just going to equal x. So now that we have everything together, so we have our f of x and gx function, so now we can put this back together used for our IBP formula. So putting this together, so we have that this is x multiplied with the integral from 0 to x of the fractional of 1 divided by 1 minus t, and then dt. Then we evaluate this from 0 to 1, then subtract with the integral 0 to 1, then this is multiplied with x, multiply with the fractional one divided by one minus x, and then dx over here. Okay, so if I evaluate this from zero to one, so zero is gonna be zero, and if I plug one, so that means I have the integral from zero to one of, now this is one divided by one minus t, then dt, subtract the integral zero, one, x, and then the integral, or the fractional one divided by one minus x, and then dx. So 
notice that this is just a dummy variable, so I could just replace it with just x on its own. Combine that together with the linearity, so now this is in other words the same thing as zero to one of one minus x. Then multiply with the fractional of one divided by one minus x, and then dx over here. Okay. So now let's actually do a little bit of another u substitution. We'll let u equals one minus x. Then differentiate both sides. du is equal to negative dx. So I'll just divide the negative one side, so that's fine. So now with our new integral, so this is gonna be with our new bound. So this is from one to zero. Now this is u, then multiply with the fractional one divided by u, then du, well rather negative, d, negative du. So if I just flip the bounds of integration, so of course that just changes zero to one, then u, fractional one divided by u, and then du. So notice from that result, we just proved that we have the integral from zero to one of t to the power m, and then the integral, and then the fractional one divided by t dt is equal to one divided by m subtract the Riemann zeta of m plus one divided by m plus one, for some, m is a real number, for some positive real number. So if I just substitute this back for m is equal to one, so now that actually gives out our nice case that I just plug in m is equal one, so this is just one, subtract the Riemann zeta of two, and then divide it by two, and so we know Riemann zeta two, that's Basil's problem, is pi squared divided by six, so now this is just one, subtract pi squared divided by 12, and so therefore that is our final answer to this double, double integral containing the fractional part with double variables, just like that. So yeah, that's uh, pretty cool if you ask me.